As the oldest inhabited continent on Earth, Africa bears various nicknames, such as the motherland and the cradle of life. Over a long period of time, many different cultures have developed across the lands of Africa, making it the most diverse continent. It is home to over 2,000 distinct ethnic cultures. The cultures we see in Africa today are the result of thousands of years of changing norms and traditions, from the blending and reforming of indigenous cultures as well as from outside influences. African cultures are separated by their unique combination of religious beliefs, legends and myths, arts and crafts, means of subsistence, language, music, ceremonies and celebrations, clothing, jewelry, and more. However, if we follow the branches of any one culture back to its roots, we find commonalities shared by most of the indigenous African cultures. Spirituality is the foundation of many customs and traditions. Most cultures believe in one God, indigenous to the land of their people. Close kinship relations and community connections result in a synergistic energy that emphasizes society over the individual. Family and social structure are strict and of vital importance, and elders deserve the highest respect. A reliance on hunting, gathering, and agricultural practices is evident in the idea that people are to cooperate with nature and develop a respectful relation with the earth. This preserves resources for future generations. Children are a valuable asset, and having many children is a blessing. Because of this, many African cultures believe in polygyny, allowing men to have multiple wives. These cultures are rich with their own art, oral traditions, rites of passage, and generational knowledge. The striking diversity of African cultures has blended together to paint the scene for this continent, much like the vibrant colors depicting them on this map. Political boundaries do not define these ethnic groups. In fact, when you add in the political boundaries of the many nations of Africa, you see the scars left behind from the colonial era when European nations scrambled to carve up Africa for its resources, a story that is all too familiar from our own country's past. Similarly to the American Indians, the people of Africa were subjected to cultural genocide at the hands of the Europeans. European nations decided on new political borders, which did not accurately reflect the established territories of the existing groups of people. Cultural tensions escalated, peaking in deep ethnic conflicts that are still ravaging the continent today. Many traditional cultures were vastly altered during this period of European assimilation, resulting in a stunning variety of ways of life formed from the combination of generational customs and beliefs with non-traditional societal practices and conveniences. However, there are ethnic groups that have shown remarkable resilience to the constant beratement of change agents, clinging to the traditions that have defined their culture for centuries. The Maasai people are an example of how one ethnic group individualizes the commonalities of African culture. It is believed the Maasai originated in northern Africa before migrating down to the plains of Kenya and Tanzania in the 1600s. They are semi-nomadic pastoralists, moving with the seasons to find food and water for their livestock herds. The Maasai revere cattle above all other animals, and it is a central theme of their spirituality. Enkai, their one god, is said to have created three groups of people. First, Enkai created the Torobo, who were to rely on honey and wild animals for food. This is why it is taboo for the Maasai to hunt or to eat most wildlife, as it was not their gift. Next, Nkai created the Kaikuyu, and he gave these people seeds and grain. Lastly, Nkai created the Maasai, to which he gave the cattle. Due to this belief, the Maasai feel they should have sole ownership over all cattle, resulting in historical cattle raids of nearby non-Maasai ethnic groups. Cattle serve many purposes among the Maasai. They are a source of pride and a symbol of wealth. They are used to pay dowries and debts to increase social ties. While ceremonial occasions may include cattle sacrifices, the cattle are rarely slaughtered. Blood is taken from the cows in a process much like we would donate blood. Milk is the basic food staple, fresh or curdled, plain or mixed with blood. Meat is obtained from other livestock, herds of sheep and goats. Much of the lifestyle of the Maasai is based off their dedication to tending their herds. Another Maasai origin story reveals much about the gender roles of the group. Legend says the Maasai are descended from two equal tribes, one composed entirely of males and the other of females. The women worked closely with wildlife. Instead of livestock, they had herds of gazelle, antelope, and elands. Elephants helped them collect branches to build their homes, fences, and corrals, and zebras helped carry their goods during seasonal migrations. One day, while the women were grumpy and nagging their animal friends, the herds escaped and the elephants abandoned them. When the women could not find the herds, they went to live with the men who raised cattle, sheep, and goats. 
By doing so, the women gave up their equal status and their freedom, becoming reliant on men and subject to their authority. The Maasai are a strong, patriarchal society, with the women having few rights. The men speak for the women, and the women do not make decisions or have the right to own possessions independently of men. The male elders make all the community decisions, including arranging marriages for the young girls, without objections from them or their mothers. The men tend to the cattle, protecting them from predators and finding them fresh water and pasture, while the women oversee domestic tasks such as fetching water, cooking, patching roofs, collecting firewood, and raising the children. Traditional education cannot be separated from life, but rather the younger generations are constantly learning from their social interactions with the older generations. Starting around age four, boys begin to tend the livestock herds with the men, and girls help the women with domestic chores. Until the 21st century, very few Maasai boys received a non-traditional education and virtually no Maasai girls were educated. The Maasai live in a temporary settlement known as an inkang or a kraal, where the married elders live with their families. The women construct houses from a framework of sticks, filling in the gaps with leaves and grasses and plastering the entire outside with a mixture of mud, clay, and the dung of cattle or wildebeest. The men are responsible for building a large circular fence around the Nkang as a way of keeping livestock in and predators out at night. Traditionally, a temporary Nkang held four to eight families in eight to 20 houses. The social structure of the Maasai is largely based on an age system, which divides the males into age sets, typically spaced by about 15 years. Each age set moves through the following social hierarchy together as a group, childhood, junior warrior, senior warrior, junior elder, and senior elder. Women belong to the age set of their husband. Maasai men may have as many wives as they wish if they can afford to pay the bridal dowry. The size of an Nkang demonstrates social status. If a man is wealthy with cattle, he can afford more dowries, have more wives, and will need more huts. The Maasai do not have centralized authority in the form of headmen or chiefs. Elders and ritual leaders are consulted for advice and decisions are made by reaching a consensus among the elders. The rites of passage between each stage of life are very important to the Maasai, each having its own unique customs and traditions, which the Maasai take great pride in completing. Some of these traditions, such as killing a lion to become a warrior or the female circumcision rite, have been topics of contention in recent political times, resulting in some of the Maasai traditions being outlawed in Kenya and Tanzania. At the turn of the 19th century, the Maasai had gained a reputation as fierce warriors by raiding cattle, expanding into neighboring grassland territories to feed their growing cattle numbers, and overpowering Arab traders who attempted to venture through the Maasai land with their goods. By 1830, wars broke out between Maasai clans. The group began to splinter, and enemies of the Maasai saw this as an opportunity to take back their cattle. Then the Europeans came, bringing with them a new cattle disease that decimated 80% of the Maasai cows. The Maasai population was decimated by famine and by new human diseases as well. Europeans forcibly removed them from their lands and reduced the size of their territory, much like they did to the American Indians. Europeans brought in missionaries, enforced new regulations, opened schools to teach Western ideologies, and used corporal punishment and fear to demand obedience. Despite this, the Maasai held firm to their cultural traditions, many of which remain unchanged. But the problems of the Maasai did not end with independence from colonial rule. Kenya and Tanzanian governments continued, and still do to this day, to reduce the amount of land Maasai have grazing rights to. The fragmentation of land makes it difficult to sustainably rotate the grazing patterns of their herds, a practice they have done for hundreds of years. The delicate balance of their relationship with the earth has been broken. The Nkangs, which used to be fairly small and temporary in location, are becoming more permanent as they swell with more people and more livestock. As a result, overgrazing from the cattle has begun to take its toll on the environment, which is another major issue facing the Maasai. Much of their land has gone to the creation of national parks, and the tourism industry is the largest industry in the area. Recently, there have been social media campaigns to save the Nagorogoro Crater, a biodiversity hotspot in a conservation area that allows Maasai pastoral use. The degradation of this ecosystem is being largely blamed on the Maasai for overgrazing, while largely ignoring the impact of the tourism industry. I admit, a year ago, I was a guilty party to that industry, but I cherish the morning I spent with Mingate, a Maasai warrior. Mingate shared an interesting perspective on the national park system in Tanzania. Many of the parks in northern Tanzania were created from Maasai land in areas that had high concentrations of megafauna. The government moved the Maasai off the land when the parks were created. 
Mangate told us how the Maasai and the wildlife of the area have a relationship and like to live together. When the Maasai moved, the animals followed. The government made a new park, evicted the Maasai again, and the animals followed yet again. Mangate says this pattern repeated until the Maasai ended up at the Ngorogoro Conservation Area, which he believes resulted in the high concentration of animals within the park. He explained to us that the grazing wildlife of the plains like to live around the Maasai because they are fierce lion hunters, protecting their herds while at the same time providing protection for the wildlife. If this is true, apparently the government hasn't learned from their previous mistakes, as they are considering evicting the Maasai yet again. As grazing lands continue to diminish and the Maasai struggle to survive based on their traditional subsistence, some Maasai have opted for their children to receive a non-traditional Western education in hopes of a brighter future. Unfortunately, the educational opportunities of their region, which were largely shaped by colonialism and Western cultures, are not providing the desired results. The majority of the Maasai people live in very remote areas of extreme poverty. Unlike in the U.S., which has compulsory laws, children in Kenya and Tanzania are not required to go to school. Often, tuition for primary school is free, but students may require boarding, books, and uniforms, all of which require money. The cost of school is prohibitory for many. Even if the Maasai can afford the fees, there is no transportation like in the U.S., and they must walk long distances from remote villages. These areas of poverty have few resources to aid in schoolwork, such as electricity or internet connections. Many of the schools use standardized curricula and assessment. Just like in our own education system, the standardization process, which was intended to reduce bias, actually created bias for the minority groups. Schools replaced the Ma language of the Maasai with Swahili in primary schools and English in secondary schools. The standardized curriculum largely criticizes the pastoral way of life, instead emphasizing more urban and Western cultural norms. Due to these setbacks, most Maasai children do not pass the exam required to move on to secondary school, and few make their way to the university level. Female students have even less of a chance of attending secondary school, as they are most commonly made to go through their rites of passage and enter into marriage. The result? The Maasai receive an incomplete education that makes them poorly prepared for the job market. At the same time, while they were in school, they miss the cultural training from their own community, leaving them with very few opportunities. These current educational methods are very different from traditional practices. Just like African cultures across the continent have commonalities, the educational practices of these cultures have commonalities as well. Research identifies seven major goals of traditional African education, which aims to develop a child's latent physical skills, character, respect for elders and authority figures, intellectual skills, vocational knowledge and skills, as well as a healthy attitude towards honest labor, a sense of belonging and participating in family and community affairs, and lastly, an understanding and appreciation of the cultural heritage of their community. In our own education system, we may briefly touch on all of these subjects during a student's career, but we really focus our efforts into developing intellectual skills to prepare students for college. This comparison is interesting. How did these traditional cultures manage to achieve seven goals with their educational system, while we failed to achieve the only goal set by our own education system? As stated before, it is hard to separate traditional education from life itself. Generational knowledge transforms every adult into a teacher, and the education of a child becomes the responsibility of a whole community. One child may learn from 20 teachers, and they are constantly learning all day long. In our society, one teacher struggles to gain enough resources from a school, never mind the larger community, to teach 20 children for a confined period of time. Unlike Western education, which focuses on written language, traditional education is largely based on oration, and the spoken language plays an incredibly important role in learning. Cultural beliefs and moral teachings are passed on through storytelling. Generational knowledge pertaining to herbal treatments, vocational knowledge, arts and crafts techniques, and much more is verbally passed on to the next age group. Proverbs, riddles, and word games are used to promote using language creatively and effectively, problem solving, critical thinking, and math skills. In fact, learning is synonymous with playing. Many other skills are learned through imitation play. Yet in our own school system, we've largely eliminated play from our curriculum. Lastly, traditional education relies heavily on vocational training and apprenticeships to teach particular skills to certain people chosen by the elders. The social nature of traditional education allows youth to gradually acquire the skills and knowledge they will need at their own rate, aptly preparing them for their specific role in the greater society. 
In our own system, we provide everyone with the same education at the same rate, creating achievement gaps and leaving something to be desired when we expect them to diversify in the workforce. So what does all this mean for us as teachers in the American education system? In all honesty, the probability of a U.S. teacher having a Maasai child in a classroom is slim. However, Black Africans are one of the fastest growing groups of U.S. immigrants, and over the past decade, the diversity of ethnic groups included in the African immigrant population has increased drastically. This means teachers need to be prepared by understanding the commonalities of African culture, and at the same time, how they are unique from group to group. Most immigrants from Africa enter the U.S. as refugees or through the Diversity Visa Program, which aims to increase immigration rates from underrepresented countries. Due to the success of these programs, African immigrants have lower unauthorized entry rates than many other immigrant groups. In addition, Black African immigrants tend to have higher levels of education and English language proficiency than other immigrant groups. These factors indicate they generally have better prospects for integration into the U.S. workforce and education system. Research indicates Black African immigrant populations are higher in some states than with others. Minnesota is one of these states. As teachers, we need to be prepared to create a culture of pluralism in our classroom, welcoming students with experiences in a wide variety of customs, beliefs, traditions, and learning styles. Some fear that even with multicultural education on the rise, the minorities of the minorities, so to speak, remain voiceless and marginalized. With limited time and resources, many feel that only minority cultures with the largest demographic and linguistic representations are included in multicultural curricula. Although the African immigrant population in America is growing rapidly, it remains an overall small portion of the immigrant population as a whole. The students from these cultures are at high risk for slipping through the cracks of the American education system. So how do we prevent it? First, we need teachers to have greater access to multicultural training programs, enabling them to see the world through a lens other than their own. Many African immigrants place a high value on education and therefore may enter a classroom with optimism and determination. Naturally, due to the culture shock, there will be an adjustment time for students in which they require patience and understanding, just like all of our other students. Lack of multicultural education and overbearing curriculum demands often limit the time and patience educators require to identify the needs of a student whose culture is different than their own. To make the problem worse, African immigrants are inappropriately lumped together with African American and Afro-Caribbean students whose experiences and cultures are vastly different and therefore would dictate different learning needs. For example, due to their culture's respect for elders, an African immigrant student may adopt an attitude of silence or avoid eye contact with the teacher. With such a rich variety of African languages, they are largely missing from most language programs within schools. It may be necessary to seek language and other resources from outside the school to help the student, as well as his or her family, adjust to their new life. Getting to know resources in the community may give a teacher a greater insight into the student's culture, creating the opportunity for more meaningful connections inside the classroom. It is important the student and the family feel that their culture is welcome in the school. All too often, immigrant students begin to feel a divide of self, as if they need to be one person at home and another person at school. I want my students to know that they can bring their whole self into my classroom. Anything that creates an atmosphere of cultural positivity will be a benefit to all of the students, not just the immigrant students. If teachers do not make an active effort to connect the curriculum to students' past experiences, it won't be long before that student's motivation disappears. It will be important to unite aspects of African culture and the curriculum, incorporate studying the consequences of overgrazing in a science lesson on erosion, discuss the importance of proverbs for remembering big ideas, and study various proverbs of a variety of African cultures in English class. Explore the variety of oral traditions from cultures around the world and allow students the opportunity to create their own. To this day, I vividly remember my favorite unit of second grade. We read the Ojibwe legend of how Bear lost his tail. After reading a variety of similar folklore, we had the opportunity to create our own. Parent aides came in to help us make paper mache animal head puppets to match. Then, using our puppets, we had the opportunity to tell our stories in front of the class. As I was obsessing over dolphins at the time, I wrote the story, How the Dolphin Got His Blowhole. I may have missed a few of the finer nuances at that age, but the lesson certainly has left a lasting impression on me. What a powerful way to bring to life oral traditions in a second grade classroom. The opportunities are endless, but the responsibility is on us as teachers.
It is not just an opportunity for us to teach the student our culture, but it is also an opportunity to learn firsthand from a student of another culture, an opportunity we should immerse ourselves in to improve our global citizenship and deepen our understandings of the beauty of human diversity. I understand as a teacher, I am committing myself to lifelong learning, reflecting on experiences, and using that reflection to change for the better of my students. Each group of students brings with them a diverse set of experiences and traditions, and thus a new opportunity to learn. By consistently developing fresh and relevant curriculum that is directly applicable to their lives, I'm keeping it fresh for me as well, allowing a certain threshold of excitement and passion to accompany each lesson. I only hope that my students will be as excited to share their knowledge with me as I am to share mine with them.